we're recording this in December of 1994. We're talking with Larry Rice, who is the president and general manager of KBRB AM and FM in Ainsworth and has other interests in broadcast stations. He is a member of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame and has served as president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association and a longtime board member by by all discussions at this point he's one of the longtime leaders in broadcasting in Nebraska. Larry, to get us started, how did you get into broadcasting? Well, uh, I started broadcasting in Missouri and uh, it was a high school effort. We decided that it would be kind of neat to have a high, uh, school news on a broadcast station in Maryville, Missouri. And I had an English teacher, I guess it was at the time, who basically pushed for that uh, and the local station accepted and so we we began our broadcasting career I began the broadcasting career by doing that simple little task once a week and then my interest grew from there I guess what was the next step after the high school broadcasting experience well I went on to college at that location Northwest Missouri State College in Maryville Missouri and uh, came from a very uh, small farm background and parents really didn't have a lot of money so uh, I needed some part-time work and there was an opening there I guess or at least I asked for an opening there and sometimes I had to mop the floors and a few things like that but I did get some airtime in it was a daytime only station so there wasn't a lot of hours but I would go out early in the morning before class and catch an hour or two and then after school so what was the call sign of the station KNIM what was the next step after that location well, from that, uh, some, someone told me about or someone called one day and said that KFEQ Television in St. Joseph, Missouri uh, had an opening. And uh, so I went to the interview. I remember, I remember the interview, how difficult it was because I'd never interviewed for a job before, an audition for a job. And I remember how... Uh, I thought I was an old hand at broadcasting until I got in front of the lights, you know, and uh, was told to sell this TV monitor or whatever it was. And so anyway, uh, that's that was my next step and the next job. This is Channel 2 in St. Joseph, Missouri, which subsequently had the call sign KQ-TV, yeah, right. but it was KFEQ-TV at the time. What, uh, what did you do in the television? Well, the first thing was a booth announcer, a job, which everybody did, you know, and it was, it was kind of boring because you sat there for a half hour through a network program and then made a quick ID and maybe a short announcement. And I remember all the fun things like beeping once, you know, and the, uh, that was for a slide, and if you beep twice, it was for film, and I would get confused, and the, the great engineers back in the back would always <laughs> save my bacon and put up the right thing even though I called for the wrong thing. But... It was a booth announcer job. Then uh, we, had a, uh, we had an art director who served as the um, Kitty's program, Uncle Dudley. That, and, was the, that was the name of the program? Right. And Uncle Dudley was a, was a nice guy, and I liked him. And, and he, he drew pictures, and he, was, he had some art talent, and I liked to do some of those things, too. So he was also the station pilot. And uh, every now and then, Uncle Dudley had to be gone, so I was the heir apparent for that on a relief job. So I got into that category, and the, we had a we had an excellent weatherman. What was your what, what did they, what was your name when they were on the air? <laughs> I was Cousin Elmo. Where did that come from? Well, it came from Uncle Dudley. He uh, had to come up with something, and uh, when he was gone, why that would had to be my title, and he gave it to me, and. It stuck for a short time. <laughs> so you were the you were the on the air television kid show yeah. host a part of the time. In yeah. addition to your other kinds of responsibilities, we showed just cartoons. It was after school, like all the TV stations at that time had a program, and and uh, we had a giraffe who drank just right milk, and you know you had to go through all of those things. It was it was a fun thing, and then you'd go to a cartoon, and then come back in again. And again. What years were were you at the station? Well, this would have been about 1957 in that area. Uh, I started in 56 is when I really started broadcasting in, uh, in Maryville, Missouri, and then moved down there shortly and went to work in about 57, somewhere in that neighborhood. How long I went did, to college a couple of years. How long did you stay at Channel 2? Not very long, really. Uh, after I, Johnny Yates, 
who was the man I was started to refer to, was our uh, was our weatherman, and he he was good. And he, you know, at that time growing up in Missouri, the goals were always to, well, if you can just make it to Kansas City or St. Louis, then you've got it made. And uh, Johnny made that step. He went into to uh, KCMO at Kansas City, so that left an opening in weather, and I liked that. It was interesting, and it was. Uh, it was something that the viewers really, really relied on, and so uh, I, I got that job. So I switched to weather, and it was only twice a day, you know, 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock, and I mean, I, I almost went crazy because I'd go down to Rosecrans Fields, you know, and, and at that time, getting weather was a more difficult task. Uh, you looked at their maps, and then you kind of memorized some of it or got some copies, and you went back up to the station. And, but the gap between shows was so long, you know. You went through rehearsal and you did all of those things, but I really became bored. And so KFEQ also had the AM operation there. And uh, I asked if I could do something, you know, maybe go on there. So I did that. And I was on the air working one night and I received a telephone call from Kansas City. And... Uh, a man identified himself as a manager of a station there and said that uh, he had some, he had an opening and would like for me to come down and, and apply for it. And again, in my, in my thought of what all should happen in my broadcast career, that was exactly what I wanted to have happen. So I went to Kansas City and went back into radio full-time there. What sort of a job was that in Kansas City in terms of uh, the radio responsibilities? It was just... Uh, uh, just an announcing job uh, on the air. I uh, shift with music. Music. What was the station? KBKC. Our studios were over in Mission, Kansas. Beautiful location. Uh, we played. We played uh, the big standards. You know the Frank Sinatra, the things like that. So our listeners were not quite up to par. We, uh, we had a very narrow audience. We had several Cadillac dealers who bought ads and a few things like that, but we never had the great numbers. And that's the first time that I'd really lived by this numbers game. Yeah, I wasn't used to that. But uh, you went by the numbers and who was rated number one and number five and number 15. There weren't that many stations at that time, but uh, it was interesting. I really enjoyed it. How did you get from Kansas City uh, Big Time Radio to um, the manager, uh, owner, uh, investor in Nebraska radio stations? Well, it was at that time when, uh, when a possibility came up that I could uh, become a part owner. And again, you know, I'm, I'm fairly young in my career, but that intrigued me. I thought, well, golly, I could, I could be kind of the man who, who owns part of the piece of the action. And... Uh, so I gave up all these dreams of being the great famous uh, big-time announcer and moved to Nebraska, uh, where we went in partnership with a former employee, uh, associate of mine. Actually, he was my employer at Maryville, Missouri. And his name is Gil Posey, longtime Nebraska broadcaster now, as many people know. And uh, so Gil and I bought the station in O'Neill, Nebraska, and that was in 1959. So. From the time I started broadcasting until the time I became a part owner was a kind of a short term. But O'Neill was, uh, you know, my wife went into culture shock for a while, but uh, we really, we really fell in love with that town, and uh, still do to this day. How did you get from O'Neill to Ainsworth? Well, Gil and I both basically realized when we started that that at some time we were going to try to increase and move. Uh, add another station or do something. So we worked together for about uh, 10 years, not quite 10 years there, and kept looking and kept our eyes open. Meanwhile, some people came down from Ainsworth and uh, talked to us and said, we would like to have a station. They did not have a station at that time. So uh, we thought, well, take a look at it. Ainsworth was again smaller than O'Neill, but, uh, but I decided it could happen. And so we went through the process of the FCC and got granted the license and built it from scratch, so to speak. It was, you know, I don't know that I want to do it again, but it was fun at the time. Talk about uh, what uh, a radio license means to a community of the size of O'Neill or Ainsworth. 
I think it's 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 one of the most important things that can happen to a community. I really do, and, I, and you know there are a lot of them out there today, and a lot of communities, and but it's just a way of having an immediate contact with the people, and uh, being able to share information, and uh, you know basically all of the newspapers and our weeklies, and so they don't uh, they don't have the things that we can offer, you know. The, the, we have daily the funeral. I mean, this this sounds hokey to Kansas City people, but I mean, we have every funeral announcement on the air, and it may be on a Monday or whatever day, and uh, the newspaper could not even cover that. So, it it's such a uh, vital link to the people of the community and in, in the in information that you disseminate daily. Don't even think about it. But I mean, they don't have any other way. When these community leaders approached you and Gil Posey about the possibility of putting on the Ainsworth license, how much of that did they have in the, in the back of their mind? How much did they realize and how much did you as experienced broadcasters uh, uh, convey to them? Very little, I think. In fact, it was a mayor of the, uh, mayor of the town of Ainsworth at the time, who's still a very good friend of mine today, uh, who came down and talked to me. And I think he saw what was happening in O'Neill which was not that far away, 75 miles or so. But he saw what was happening there. He was originally from Holt County, uh, so he knew the O'Neill area. And I think he just, he wanted that for his community. He saw what it was doing there, serving them, and he wanted that to be in his town then. When did the uh, Ainsworth AM license go on the air? 68, 1968. We went on in February of 68. I worked up there for a couple of years prior to that uh, while I maintained work in, in O'Neill, but it was close enough I could go back and forth. And so uh, we finally, you know, at that time, again, a lot of changes in broadcasting. FCC changed a lot of things. But at that time, you waited for that uh, telegraph message that, that allowed you to go on the air. And it, it happened to us on... On February the 6th in 1968, I still remember the, the ticker tape message that came in. And uh, we got it on the 5th when uh, authorized to go on the air the next day. What was the, um, the, the, the authorization, the frequency, and the power for the station? 1400 and uh, was a frequency, and that, of course, was a full time uh, local channel. Uh, 1,000 watts daytime, 250 night. When did uh, the FM station go on? We put it on several years later after we actually had, had built the station at Gordon, Nebraska. We built an FM out there, put on an FM in, in O'Neill. And then, I th uh, again, in, in a kind of a, I think this is the thing to do, uh, one of my goofier moments, because you know, if I, I had it all to do over again, I probably wouldn't do it. But we, we went with an FM, and I think it was like mid-'80s, 84, 85, something like that. And it, it was just... I thought, well, you know, we really need something else to do. Things were rolling along pretty smooth, and, and it's been fun. And FM is great, you know. Everybody in the country realizes that now. But well, let's go back and backtrack a little bit and talk about the FM and Gordon. How did that uh, come about? How did the how did the company and the associates that you have get interested in that license? I had a I had a person working for me, uh, a young lady by the name of Renee Berger. Renee was so qualified. Uh, she took broadcasting at heart. You know, she wanted to learn all about it, and she was so qualified. And so there again, we were kind of looking. That was just another step. By the way, there was another station down in Norton, Kansas, who we acquired for a short time too. So we had that, and uh, so we we kept our our lines open as to another location. And I, to tell you the truth, uh, I think it came from an attorney in Gordon who, again, a roundabout way, knew us and, and said, uh, well, would there be any chance that we could have a station? So when somebody invites you like that, well, the least you can do is hire the consulting engineer and find out. And so we did, and, and so it happened. And Renee went up there to run it. And, w and again, I was uh, in the very beginnings of getting the tower crew there, and it's, like I say, it's kind of fun. but. Why did you look at the FM license for uh, Gordon as opposed to an AM license? I think that was about the only thing available at that particular time. Uh, and that was in the late 70s. 
but I believe it's only the, the thing that the search showed up that we could really find. You also mentioned the, the, um, your continuing interest in the O'Neill license and the fact that there was an FM station that went on the air there. When did that go on and what was the decision process? That happened after I'd gone to Ainsworth and FM was becoming very much more popular and there's so many inherent things about FM. FM, the things that it can do that AM cannot do, the coverage, things like that. And so this is why I think Gil became involved and, and uh, pursued the uh, FM at O'Neill. And that went on at the, this is kind of interesting, but it went on at 92.7, a uh, small 3,000 watt. Uh, I saw that development only from the outside, uh, but I liked it. And so when O'Neill decided that should be upgraded and went to the 100,000, moved up to 102.9, then I grabbed, asked for, received the 92.7 and was able to get it to Ainsworth. So I basically took that and moved it west. What's the uh, advantage to uh, each of those towns uh, with the uh, changes that have taken place in broadcasting to have both an AM and FM license? I don't know, and probably they don't know. Uh, but now, we've experimented with different programming things, we meaning our company. And O'Neill, we've gone back to what is on AM is also on FM uh, combo. I'm one of those guys who, you know, I did it this way when I started, so I'm going to keep it. I don't know why, but, you know, we're, we don't have enough people really to do this. But we still separate our programming throughout most of the day. We simulcast throughout the morning until 9 o'clock because we have so much information that we needed to have on both. And we've got a very small staff. So we, we simulcast until 9, and then we split and send music on and take care of most of the ag programs and the talk and things like that on the AM and put them back together at night maybe. But we do ball games on each side. There again is something the small community really relies on. Well, so do major markets too, but we'll do a, a Bassett ball game on the FM because we have better nighttime coverage and we can do an Ainsworth ball game on the AM at the same time. So revenue-wise, that's about the only place we make it work. But What... Uh what do you, as the, uh, the entrepreneur, the manager, the owner, uh, the, uh, the company guy, what, uh, in your kind of a situation, you are also the air personality. How do people perceive you out there in terms of, the, uh, of what's going on? I'm just another guy that goes to the coffee shop and has 42 cents and can buy coffee. You know, <laughs> I, I do games. I have taken an announcing shift. Uh, I still do five hours a day on the air, plus trying to get through the mail and maybe sell somebody occasionally if we can so we can stay on the next day. Uh, but, you know, I, uh, I've i taken my turns at everything in the community that you can do, and and uh, I'm looked at just exactly like uh, anybody else. Now, for somebody who spends five hours a day on the air and does all those other kinds of things, you've been an individual who has been very prominent in statewide activities. Uh, some dealing directly with broadcasting, but, but other kinds of things as well. How would you get interested in working with the State Broadcasters Association? I feel so strongly about a State Broadcast Association or, or a, any organization. I've always told people this in business. I, it could be the dime store. They need to be a member of their state or national organization to find out what's going on. And I, I felt so strongly about this in broadcasting and have for years. That's why I can't see why some people don't belong, you know. We've, we've talked about this before. But anyway, I think that if you're in that business, you need to associate with others who are also there and share common interest and concerns and work together. And that's why I've been, uh, I feel it's number one priority. What are some of those kinds of common interests and concerns that come to mind that, uh, that you think that the associations uh, have, um, have helped with uh, as, you, uh, as you've been an active broadcaster? Oh, there's so many things, but basically a lot of it is legislative type issues, uh, areas that, that I couldn't fight the battle alone. I mean, I'm just not big enough, not strong enough. Uh, they wouldn't pay any attention to me, but they will in association, statewide and or national. And so a lot of it is, is things that our industry 
uh, we'll have to live by or die by if we don't get together and and uh, and in a voice in a in a common voice appeal our case and make sure that the right ways are covered. So it's a legislative area, I feel. But it's a, a, a tremendous commitment for somebody in your set of circumstances. I can recall, I believe, uh, correct me if I don't remember this right, that you uh, would drive to uh, one of those meetings, um, perhaps five hours one way, preside at the meeting for two or three hours, and then drive back the same day, and then still go back and do a, a ball game at, at night. Um, that's a considerable amount of energy and considerable amount of commitment. How does that translate? Why did you do that? Well, again, it was a, it's, it's part of the process. If you're going to be involved, you should become involved. And if, if it means serving on a committee or serving as chairman, uh, if you can help, go ahead and do it. And the miles are not that bad, you know. I look at it. I don't. I never figured out uh, miles. I always figured hours. It's so many hours, and and you know the story about you know my designated driver and everything. But but there there were like five hours that we could go to Lincoln and or Omaha. It's about the same. But in five hours, if you have somebody driving for you, uh, you can do a lot of research, reading, writing. You know, make notes, things you, you needed to do. So I always tried to do that in addition to catch a nap now and then. So as long as your wife was willing to drive and to handle those kinds of things, <laughs> like, right. it made your life a little more manageable in terms of doing this. One of the, I think, the, your broadcast um, loves or enjoy is to broadcast sports. And uh, you have done a lot of play-by-play -play coverage, which is, of course, means a lot to the people in the service areas of the stations with which you've been associated. Talk a little bit about play-by-play -play sports and how it fits into a local broadcaster. Well, it's like my hospital report or the, the, any other announcements we have. It involves local people's names. And when you can do that, even with a losing season, you know, they may not, the teams may not always be winning. But if you're on the air, you're talking about some young people who, they're somebody's son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, their friend or neighbor. And so it carries an amount of interest, even losing, although winning is better, and there's more interest in winning. But uh, because of that, it just ties in the local part of it. And, you know, the kids' moms and dads request tapes of the games, and I had one turned in to me the other day from, from an old broadcast I did hundreds of years ago down in Creighton, Nebraska. You know, somebody turned in this old tape and needed it made into a cassette or something. And uh, so these... How far back was hundreds of years ago? Well, <laughs> probably the early 1960s. In fact, the school was St. Ledger's in Creighton, so it doesn't even exist anymore. And the people had the tape as they, they still... had still... the tape and needed to get it made into something that they could listen to now. Well, how did you sound back then? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't even recognize it. I thought it was somebody else. <laughs> One of the things that sometimes people talk about in terms of, um, of a, a community-based station is that the station takes on the priorities or, if you will, the personality of the uh, individual who is in charge, general manager, the owner. What do you think about that? It probably does. It probably <laughs> does because, you know, you're, like I say, we're working with a very small crew. I'm so fortunate, you know. I have, I've got uh, my man that comes in and signs on for me was a man who went to work for me back in 1968. He's still there today. Uh, he does certain things, you know, and and we've been together so long. He knows exactly how I'm going to react or not react, <laughs> and uh, so we've we've grown uh, uh, we've grown together. Uh, the other key man that I've had been with me for at least 20 years, and uh, he's my engineer. He's my other sportsman. Everybody basically does everything. If you can't, well, you wouldn't have a job there. But uh, so we all sell some advertising. We all uh, take some turns on getting it on the air and so on. But, uh, but based in that, the fact that we've been together so long, uh, would I would I would agree that you know they know that this is a way he wants it done. I'd rather have it some other way. But not that I won't, uh, you know, we've changed a lot. And sometimes the Federal Communications Commission, as a matter of public policy, has said we really favor the local owner, entrepreneur, the individual who is there, 
as opposed to the absentee owner. Um, how does that translate out as far as you, uh, as the, the local owner is concerned, but also an individual who has investments in other stations? Well, I can see I can see that, and I can see why it's important because you undoubtedly have a better feel for what the community need is. You know, if there's a need in the community, if you're living there, working with it, you know that that's something you need to be addressing, and will address it. And therefore, you know, back in the old days when we were under the public affairs criteria of what are you doing, you know, uh, and really putting it down, I, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even worry about that today because we do so much because we realize what's happening. I'm there every day, and I know that if if uh, the city council's got a problem with streets or whatever, we're going to cover it. We're going to do stories on it, et cetera. So that helps. That helps a lot. You know, I see so many things in broadcasting now that new technology has made it so easy to put up a station and walk away from it. I'm a little worried about that, but uh, you know, I, it's working. Stations are doing well, but I, I'm from the old school, I guess. And I like to have somebody there. If somebody calls, I like to know that somebody's on the phone talking to them and find out that the DAT Extension Club is going to be canceled tonight because of snow, and we can get it on the air. But it's the individual involvement uh, that, uh, that you, um, you come up with in that set of circumstance. It seems to me I remember talking with you at one point, and um, there was a... Um, an event, and I'm not quite sure what it was, but uh, three or four or five years ago, you uh, carried um, some programming from some state or federal investigating uh, discussion on your AM license. You continued your regular programming on your FM license, but you essentially took off your regular programming on the AM license. Uh, if I remember that correctly, what was that? It was a Niobrara River uh, issue of the uh, Norton Dam. Uh, and that was highly important. It was, uh, they brought out uh, congressional people to set through hearings, and uh, I felt it was very important. The city hall was packed. Uh, it was a highly controversial issue of whether the dam should be built or not, Le led to the scenic river situation. And uh, so we just decided to carry it, you know, from gavel to gavel, so to speak. And, and we've, we've done that with many, many things since that time. But, uh, again, there's a flexibility of having the two licenses together. If somebody doesn't want to hear that, they can go to the other place and catch their, their uh, uh, Paul Harvey or whatever. But meantime, we can take that and play it all the way through. Who makes the decision when you, uh, when you decide to do that? Oh, I do, probably. But I... But, again... I always try to go to my key people and say, you know, here are, here's our options. What do you think? Uh, you think we should do this? Here, I, I've kind of got this idea. And I would, I would like for them to buy into it early, because if they will, then, then it'll be successful. When you carry something as uh, that, that event or others that you may have described, uh, you have to delete the commercials, do you not? Right. So this is essentially money out of the corporate pocket, your pocket or your associates' pockets to be able to do that. How, uh, Don't tell them. They won't know. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? How do you make that sort of thing work in terms of uh, the, the entrepreneurial spirit? I think it'll come back. You know, I've always feel it. Whatever I lose, you know, if you're providing a service and doing the job right, then that material thing, which is, you know, we've got to have it, or we can't pay the pay the electric bill and keep on going. But I think if you're doing the job, that what you miss today will be back and come back to you, maybe a little bit more. Now, in your uh, role as a uh, broadcaster, you've also become, obviously, a community leader, an individual who is uh, uh, looked upon for that area of the state as somebody who is perhaps a spokesperson, an individual who has some understanding of what's going on. You served uh, in some various other capacities outside of broadcasting uh, for the state. Talk about those for a moment. Well, when somebody asks, you know, as, as many people do, you have a hard time saying no. You do learn to say no to a few things, but some things I think carry some importance. I served for several years on the Tourism Advisory Board for the state of Nebraska, and I felt tourism was very important. And uh, I enjoyed that, uh, my association there, and maybe some imp input about why certain areas don't forget us, you know, keep, keep us in mind. 
So the same thing happened when I served four years and just completed that in this, this past fall, this month, I guess, actually, uh, on the Rural Development Commission. And again, I felt that was so, uh, that was so important an issue, uh, and the governor made it, uh, made it important to him and to his campaign to try to do what he could for rural Nebraska. And so being invited to serve on that commission, I accepted that. And uh, I don't know that I had very much impact, but I learned a lot. And hopefully I shared some information during my four-year term on that Rural Development Commission because we're losing population. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a worry of mine in our stations that most of the counties in Nebraska has lost population in the last census period. Uh, the majority of them. And so I, I worry about that trend because of my future and the people's future who live in those communities. So anything I could do, uh, and technology, uh, you know, may be, may be the thing that will get some of the rural communities going again. The availability of uh, being able to do business in Long Pine, Nebraska, worldwide, is there because of technology. That's the sort of thing that um, is uh, becoming clearer as we go along, but it's the sort of thing that you've obviously had as part of your vision for a good amount of time in terms of the way that you've been in the, um, the business. Uh, you, you talked a little bit about other stations that you've been associated with. You talked about Gordon, you talked about Norton, Kansas, you talked about O'Neill. Um, other opportunities obviously have come along. How did you happen to decide to stay in Ainsworth? I guess because of the family uh, and the fact that uh, you know, I, I, I said we fell in love with O'Neill, Nebraska, and uh, then we fell in love with Ainsworth, and we've just been there ever since. And uh, we've got so many friends there, and the kids grew up there, all graduated from high school there. My family was basically all, all except one were born in O'Neill, but we did have one youngster born in, in Ainsworth, but they all went through the school. Uh, great environment, you know, as far as Moving out of Kansas City at the time that I did and heading to northern Nebraska, knowing the strife and some of the things that Kansas City had made it easier because we were getting ready to have a family. And I was a, a farmer, you know, farm boy background. And so that ruralness uh, made it easier for me. And, uh, yeah, you know, there have been some other doors that have knocked, and, and I just you know, I don't like money, so I just like to sit there and have fun and didn't want to take any big uh, income tax deals. What, uh, what is this, uh, your current involvement as of uh, this date that we're talking about in terms of other stations beyond those in uh, Ainsworth? Basically, that's about it. Uh, the O'Neill and Ainsworth now is basically my only uh, contacts, uh, uh, the, the interest, uh, financial interest at this time because we're in the process of selling uh, the Gordon station to a young man who again that's an, again it's another <coughs> excuse me it's another area of our broadcasting philosophy but we have we have always trained young people uh, worked with uh, high school kids uh, keep about four to five working all the time so that they've got the flexibility to doing the things in school that they want to do and yet somebody else can take their shift but we work with them we train them uh, and one of those young kids uh, has that worked for me in a high school student bought the station in Gordon. So uh, we're out of that. I've got the uh, the O'Neill and the Ainsworth, and that's it. What's it take to uh, to look at somebody uh, as you have and as Gil Posey did with you and say you have the entrepreneurial spirit. You can be successful in a in a, in a radio station. Oh, you know, because you go through them a lot, but there's every now and then there's just somebody who's got that little extra about them. Normally they will ask to do more than what you're trying to give them. That's the first key for me. If I find a young person or an employee who will ask, what else can I do? I would like to really learn about this. When you run onto that sort of a person, then that's the kind of person that will uh, will probably make it. 
Now let's turn in a slightly different direction and talk about some uh, broadcasters that you may have known in, the, in your years in the business. And uh, I'll just kind of float through some of the names. And, uh, and if you feel like you want to comment about them, why well, that's fine. And if you don't, why well, we'll just kind of move on in terms of the process. But I'll start out with Bud Pence. Bud Pence. Bud was probably the most uh, dynamic stand-up, go-get-em type man that I have ever seen, uh, you know, from the handlebar mustache to... He was a guy who was president of the association, drove to my town on a Sunday, got out with his dog and came in and talked to me at the house, you know. I, I, so Bud, Bud was a, a real character in our industry. And, uh, and he's the only one, Bud Pence, only one. He's a... Uh, um was from, uh, just for the clarification, uh, from a long time owner of KWBE uh, in Beatrice, who uh, retired from that position uh, some, some time ago. I visited his plant and I was impressed. Bud, Bud had everything that a, that a relatively small, Beatrice is big to me, but a relatively small station should have. Bud had it. He, he had equipment, he had people. Yeah, I think he did a great job. Your longtime associate, Gil Posey, is also somebody who's very prominent in Nebraska broadcasting. Certainly. Gil and I said go back a long, long way, so we go back to 1956. You know, Gil probably wouldn't even want me telling about this, but I mean, back in those days, Larry, they, uh, we did live programming. And they had the Jack and Gil show. I mean, they picked guitars and sang songs, you know, for 15 minutes each day during the noon hour or something sponsored by your neutrino feed dealer. I don't know who it was, but he, you know. And so we go back a long ways, and I can kid with him because I, I, I was there, I listened to this, and uh, it, it may have sounded kind of hokey at the time. It may, may sound hokey now, but it, it was real radio at that time. And I was, I was accustomed to going to KMA in Shenandoah, Iowa, and watching the shows live anyway. So the little Maryville, Missouri station that had some live, but... So Gil and I go back a long ways, into those 50s. And so then we went kind of our separate way, and, and, uh, and he wound up in Nebraska and found the opening at O'Neill. So he and I have been together for a lot of years. And Talk a little bit about uh, going to watch those shows at KMA. Hey, that was, that was just like going to a movie, only it was real people up there on the stage. In fact, it looked like a movie theater, and uh, we would go to to Shenandoah quite often, and they happen to have two great, great stations, you know. It was, it was unusual as I look back on it now. At that time, I didn't think about it. But they had two big stations, powerful uh, stations, for their time in that one little town. And uh, the programming, Everly Brothers, the, the Blackwood Brothers, all the people, you know, and, and they would be on for like 15 or 30 minutes at a time, and then somebody else, they'd read a little bit of news. and but in front of a glass enclosure, and there they were entertaining around in front of you, and you could sit out there and watch them or leave if you wanted to, buy some seed corn and head back home. How far was Shenandoah from your hometown? Oh, a couple hours. So it was um, an easy uh, yeah. opportunity to do that. How many times would you have gone to, to Shenandoah to actually watch the radio programs? Well, I never went to watch the radio programs. It was always to buy flower seeds or something <laughs> like that, you know, because I was with my folks, but uh, that always wound up at at that place, and so, oh, I don't know, probably uh, probably a dozen as a youngster. You recall, obviously, the names of several of the personalities who Some, right. later it's achieved a great yeah, deal of prominence in, in terms of, uh, of that operation. The, the stations were KMA and KFNF in, right. in Shenandoah, as I recall. Do you, re you, do you recall one or the other in terms of that this comes out in your memory? Oh, KMA probably, the May family, you know, uh, was probably the primary, but my folks had listening habits, you know. They listened for certain things on one station, Henry Fields on, on uh, KFNF, and uh, Earl May on the other side. Both of them happened to be in the nursery business, you know, so it made it kind of an interesting situation. But they had listening habits, uh, as, as probably everybody does today yet, and listened for certain things in the morning or noon or whatever. So that, those were the ones I listened to most. How did that uh, experience of the Shenandoah stations affect your interest as a high school guy um, going into that, as we talked about earlier? It intrigued me. You know, there's, that's, that's something. You know, they're setting up there. I can hear them back at home in this little farm at Pickering, Missouri. 
and they're coming in and they're telling me what the weather's going to be like and things like that of highly important. So would it be fair to say that uh, when your folks took you over there to uh, buy things and happened to see the radio station, they may have, without thinking about it, started this possibly. change of career? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but possibly that was it. Interesting, um, interesting way to look at that. Who are some other uh, uh, Nebraska broadcasters that uh, come to mind as you, uh, as you think about uh, your years in the business? Oh, we've had so many great ones, you know, and I, I think of people who served in the presidency of the uh, Nebraska Broadcasters Association went on to some great, great things, but uh, I guess the people that you work with the most, you know, would be like Frank Fogarty, just a gentleman's gentleman, you know. If, if the broadcasting industry wanted anybody who, who they could say, here's somebody who represents us well, it would be somebody like that. And then, uh, you know, we had... Ed Schaefer, and Ed did a great job for us, I remember, and uh, we, we've talked about it a lot of times, and then the, the search again for someone else, because that job doesn't change a lot, really. These I don't the, know how long Frank was there. These are the executive directors of the Nebraska right. Broadcasters Association, and, and for our from point of reference, uh, Frank was a retired president of the Meredith Broadcasting, the Omaha WOW stations, but was the executive director basically in the 70s, and then Ed Schaefer was through about... Um, 1982 to 1989, roughly, I suppose. And uh, yet, uh, as I recall, it was when you were president that they changed the position again, which meant that you had the, uh, the burden, shall we say, of hiring the individual who would fill those uh, unusual shoes. Well, it was, yeah, it was probably a burden, and yet it was quite an experience, and we went through it together. You know, so and if it hadn't been for a person like you here with a, uh, the expertise and the years that you had behind that to help, help us out, it, we'd probably never made it through. But it was an interesting thing. And like say, Ed, you and I went back to Washington, D.C. with him. Ed was very well known. He, was, he, he knew his way around. He was an excellent man. He didn't know that much about broadcasting originally. But I think he grew and learned, and, and so I, I gained a lot of, of, of confidence in Ed Schaefer. And then we found, you know, on the search, we had so many qualified candidates. When it came down to that table that last day, you know, toughest, one of the toughest uh, decision days, you know, in my personal life, I think, was choosing someone out of a highly qualified list that we had. We came up with Dick Palmquist, you know, perfect choice, I think. We, uh, we also alluded to the fact there that the broadcasters, you as an individual broadcaster, as the president of the association, necessarily have some interaction with government, government leaders, elected officials, senators, members of Congress, governors, and so forth. Talk about how that kind of situation has evolved during your years in broadcasting. Well, it's so important to, it's so important to have, a, have a working knowledge with these people. And to be able to go into their office or to be able to get them on the phone and say, you know, hey, it's me. You know me, I know you, and, and we can talk, you know. And that's why uh, the trips to Washington, I think, were so important. And the visits with our Washington representatives when they come home, or on a closer level, our people in Lincoln at the unit camera, and to be able to visit with them and to be able to, you know, one-on-one -on -one say, you know, Howard Lamb, you're my senator, you know. We can talk about this. Uh, I, we may differ a little bit, but let's, let's listen to one another and see why we feel as we do, you know. And, uh, and Jim Jones is my man now. And I mean, I want to be the same way with whoever it is serving. And I want to reach out a little bit further than that. You want to, you want to, you want to be able to do that with another one or two or three or more. Uh, they're very important people. I recall traveling with you to Washington, D.C. one time and getting up early to go to a breakfast. And, uh, and uh, well, those of us who were in the, um, the entourage came down, and, and you came in the front door of the hotel. And you, as I recall, had been at a payphone across the street from the White House and had done a call-in on your morning show in Ainsworth, Nebraska, while the rest of us were just barely getting down there at whatever it was, 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, you know, I'd never been to Washington, D.C. up to that time. That was my first trip. And that's, that's amazing. And, and I, I saw so many things in that short trip. When I got back home, I said, oh, man, what a mistake I've made by not taking my kids back there when they were in, in junior high or something, because there's so much history back there. Well, see, so here it was, a, a beautiful day, I can't remember. But anyway, uh, to me, just to go out and walk and walk around the White House uh, and think, uh, you know, the, other, the people who have been there, and uh, it, was, it was so great, and it was about 
as I recall, it was about 6 o'clock back home, you know, and I knew that my man, Ken, would be signing on, and I was going to do a live report, you know, just from the pay telephone right, uh, right by the White House just to tell him where I was, and to me it was kind of interesting. How do you uh, rate the um, interest in, the acceptance of uh, the broadcaster's goals and ideas by uh, the Nebraska elected officials over the years that you've been observing it? You know, we have had, uh, our relationship has been so good, I think, with our governors. We meet with them regularly. We're welcome basically on, on a regular basis to, to visit with them. And it's cross party lines. You know, it could be a Republican, it could be a Democrat. It, that doesn't matter. It just matters that the communication is there. And I think they have felt that there is such a, the media has been such an asset to our peoples and our communities and helping them that, that they realize how important it is to be able to communicate. And we're able to link that up with them. In your leadership role, have you ever found uh, one of those people opposed to ideas that you were setting forth? Oh, yeah, slightly. You know, some of them uh, have, see some differences, uh, uh, their ideas about how, we sh how far we should go, be able to go, what sh we should be able to do. There have been some, some differences. Some of them have all also changed. Maybe we've changed. Uh, some things in our industry, you know, uh, we have some people who don't help us in our own industry that come on too strong, do things maybe they shouldn't have done, go out of bounds, they stepped over the line. And that hurts us all, you know. So we need to walk, guard against those kind of things, those incidents. But by and large, I think that uh, they can see past those. They know that's going to happen. It happens on their team. Reversing the process, when you talk to people who are state legislators, or members of uh, the House of Representatives, or the United States Senate, or the governorship, when they come to you uh, and trying to convey their views to the people who live in the coverage area of the radio stations that you represent, how do they see that radio station as being something that they, they want to um, use as a vehicle to be able to, to uh, respond to citizens' needs? I think that this is exactly what, what I basically referred to earlier, is that they see that this is as a, as a communication link, that we're, we're a vehicle that they can use and to, to tell a story about what's happening. This is why every week during the unicameral session, we have our we have our representative on, our legislators on the air. He's got five minutes. He's got ten minutes. We don't care. We're not down into thirty second, ten second uh, bites of information. We go into program length. Uh, here's what the week has been like, and so therefore, through the ones that I've worked with, uh, they know they're welcome. They can call. They can. Uh, put the report on, They'll, they're glad to answer questions, uh, and I think it helps them. When those people talk to you and uh, they say, gee, thank you, uh, Moira Rice, for uh, giving me the opportunity to be on the stations, what do they tell you about the response from the people out there who hear their messages? Do, they, do people call them up and say, hey, uh, Senator, I, I heard this on the radio station and I'd like to, to provide some input? Certainly. Certainly they'll tell you that. They know that. They know it's going to happen. if they. If they're telling you about an issue in the state or the, that they're going to be voting on, uh, uh, they will hear from people and they, they know that, you know. What happens of, uh, in a community-based operation if you, I believe you indicated that you spend your, your time occasionally going down to the coffee shop and getting a cup of coffee and somebody says to you, uh, gee, uh, Larry Rice, uh, I understand this sort of thing's going on in the legislature or in the uh, Federal House of Representatives or whatever, and I sure kind of like to know a little bit more about that. Uh, how does the process go when you go back to the radio station? I just go back and get on the phone. Uh, because this is where you pick up your, your ideas and, and, and this is your public response. If they want to know more about that, if one person has told you that, chances are there's several others who would like to. So then you go back and say, is it possible? Well, the only way to find out if it's possible is to call somebody and ask, you know. And generally, they're going to say, well, certainly. They're happy to do it. You know, they, 
because nobody's doing that for them. So uh, get the rest of the story, so to speak. Go dig a little deeper. Turning to a slightly different facet, at one point in your uh, broadcasting career, you spent a fair amount of time traveling uh, on the sports broadcasts. Uh, you traveled uh, with a team of people who were covering the Nebraska football games. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, that and, and, how, and how you happened to do that and why you did that. that was, those, were my, those were some of my funnest times. You know, sports to me has always been just kind of a, because I like sports, you know, has always been a very easy and interesting thing to do. And when I had the opportunity, you know, first thing I remember it was uh, I helped do something at Columbia, Missouri for Don Gill, you know. Don and I had kind of known each other through mutual friends, and Don was a broadcaster in, uh, in Alliance for a while and then worked his way down to KFEQ, St. Joe, and through an old, old friend of mine there, my acquaintance at that station, we got together. We were the best of friends, still friends. We always traded back and forth. I would go to Columbia and take in the Nebraska-Missouri game. He would come to Lincoln when they played up here. So we kept that up. Don knew that. So he said, well, you're going to be down in Columbia anyway, so why don't you come up in the booth, you guys, and you can help me spot or do something. I can't remember what our job was, but it, to me, you know, I'd never been up there, and it was quite an exciting deal. Well, anyway, it grew around to a deal where Don said, hey, would you like to do this? I said, would I? You know, certainly. It meant a lot of driving, you know. I ran off the road a lot of times, uh, half asleep, but uh, because I would do a game, you know, maybe on a Friday night at Gordon, Nebraska, and then drive back to Ainsworth and get on the road early to get it somewhere. But we, we, we did. I did that for about 10 years, and we just had a great time. Traveled with them, and we had great crews. And what, what did you do in terms of the responsibilities for the broadcast? Basically, uh, uh, boiled down to the t fact that uh, I was just a statistician. You know, I kept track of all the stats as it went and could insert and tell you how many yards a player might have at that time or how many pass completions without waiting for the quarterly reports or something that might come in on the stats. And then I did kind of a summary at halftime and into the game. Then we'd go into the locker room, and that was fun for me too because, you know, we had some kids in our part of the country with members of the team, and I would see them in the locker room after the game or before the game, and we always did the locker room show. And uh, most of the games, especially on the road, I would go down and help with that. So. Fun days. In, in all of these kinds of things, uh, we center a lot about talking about uh, localism, uh, community involvement, community interest, those kinds of things that are part of that. And uh, we sometimes hear the issues of uh, the technology delivering audio signals by a lot of different kinds of means. Uh, what do you look for in terms of uh, the, the, the relationship of the kinds of things that you've enjoyed doing during your years in broadcasting in the relationship to some of these new technologies? Well, you know, I really feel like that I've almost, uh, the world has gone past me when it gets into technology because we're still doing things, you know, it seems like when I go visiting you know, and I see how some places are doing it. I'm like back in World War II. Uh, so there are so many exciting things that are happening, making things possible. You know, not that we're, not that we haven't kept up to date, you know. We, we probably one of the first stations in our part of the country that relied on Marty equipment. So we had them in cars and we could do reports from wherever there was a fire or anything like that. So we've, and now say our phones and things of this nature. So we have kept up to date. But there are so many things happening now in technology. You know, I, I, I referred to the walk away from stations, uh, but they can do so much through the computers. And I'm lost. I, yeah, I need a younger man. How do the people in Ainsworth respond, do you suppose, to the satellite delivered signals as compared to the kinds of things that? that uh, you've been able to provide for them, the funeral notices, the sports broadcasts, and so forth. I think it would shock them for a while, but they'd get over it. And uh, see, it's just some things that we, we believe in and do, and I don't know how long we're going to be able to because you've got to utilize manpower there, you know. And, and people are doing this because of cost-cutting methods. Uh, but for now, we'll continue to do it the old way, basically. What sort of things, uh, in terms of the way that the radio stations operate, um, the, the affect public policy, the kinds of things that on a local level 
the, uh, the mayors, uh, the council, the, the county board of supervisors, those kinds of things. How does the radio station relate to those kinds of things? Well, in our situation, the day of the council meeting, we carry the agenda. It's on each one of our local newscasts, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 12 noon, 545, so the people know exactly what the city council is going to be doing that night. County commissioners, same thing. School board, same thing. I carry all their agendas. Then I attend those meetings, and so then we follow up with a story the next day of what went on, what actually happened, what action did they take. So they, they know that's going to happen. They know, and, and they see the benefit of it. Years ago, they didn't allow me to do that or, or didn't want me to do that or I didn't know it was available or I didn't know it was important. Somebody pointed out to me it would be nice if they knew exactly what the city council or the school board were going to be discussing that night. And I said, hey, yeah, it would be. So we started putting this on, and I think they really rely on it now. So they'll show up if it's an area of interest to them. That doesn't hurt anything. It may make the meeting a little bit longer, but, uh, but I think it's important. And so uh, we do that. We've been talking with Larry Rice about a variety of different kinds of topics here. And Larry, you're obviously a person who spends five hours a day on the air, so you uh, have no trouble um, thinking about kinds of things to, to, uh, to deal with. But are there things that we haven't covered in our brief discussion here that uh, maybe that uh, you'd like to, uh, to put in, please? Oh, I'm sure there are, but I can't. You know, we've, we've covered this thing from the very beginning, <laughs> Genesis to... <laughs> uh, to the beginning, to the end, I, I don't recall of anything, you know. We could sit around and probably drum up something else, but... Uh, What's been the most fun over the years? Today. I, you know, each day, I really... You, know, you never know what's going to happen. So, even though I've shared experiences of how great it was to travel around with a football team, and that was great. I remember signing on the air that first day of the station went on new. That was great. But, you know, I don't know what the rest of this day may, something may come along. And tomorrow may be even greater than that. So you know, that's what getting up and going to work uh, is fun because you never know what's going to happen. We didn't have a network uh, at KBRX and O'Neill when, when President Kennedy got shot. You know, we had to rely on that ticker tape, the, the teletype. And it was slow, and it wasn't putting out very much information. And I had the, I had that feeling, oh, he's dead. You know, just as soon as I heard those bells, you know how the bells used to, you know, in the old days, bing, 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 the bells would sound, and I heard that, and I went in and tore that story off, and uh, just said that he had been shot, you know. But I just, you know, you had that feeling, or I had that feeling, oh my. But but I felt such a lack of of being able to. You know, there was no CNN at that time or, or whatever. And uh, we, we didn't, at that time, have a network with the station, so it really hurt us. We relied o exclusively on that AP wire. But, but I don't know. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow, and, and you're going to be part of somebody remembering certain things. So I think probably tomorrow is going to be the most exciting day. Today, right now, it is, but... Larry, thank you very much. We've enjoyed the opportunity to talk with you. Our guest has been Larry Rice, the owner and operator of KBRB in Ainsworth, uh, former president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association, and recently honored as a Nebraska Broadcasters Association member of the Hall of Fame. Thank you.